Um, what I'm going to do today is first talk a little bit, uh, very briefly, about ADHD uh, as a part of an introduction. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, overall principles that are part of do, uh, using timeout with children. Then I'm going to talk about some of the parts of timeout uh, that are important to think about when you're using timeout in recreational settings or if you're working with parents and uh, helping them use those strategies in the home setting. And then we'll talk about the evidence for timeout. What does the field tell us is best practice for using timeout? And then at the very end, we're going to work some of, some of the work will be you working with your partners in here or uh, people sitting next to you. But we'll talk about how can we roll this out and make this actually work in practice and be effective for the kids we work with. And I guess I'm curious before we get started, I saw a lot of people here from the Children's Trust. How many people work in the after school programs? Good number of folks. How many people work in the summer treatment programs? How many people work with parents? Parenting programs, helping teach them strategies. What about teachers? How many people work with teachers in schools? Great. Did I leave anybody out? No. The strategies we're going to be talking about are useful in all of those settings. So I'm going to try to provide some examples across all those different settings, but I hope as you uh, have opportunities during this workshop to discuss things that you'll be able to try to focus on where this might be most useful to you in your practice and in your work. Okay? Uh, before every talk, you're supposed to talk about conflicts of interest. I have no con financial investment in using timeout from positive reinforcement. That's not something anybody uh, owns. I do use timeout with my three kids, probably a lot, I would say. Uh, and, and growing up, I received a whole ton of timeouts. I had chair timeouts, corner timeouts, room timeouts, I had backup consequences. So I actually am well versed in timeout as a recipient and as a provider. So hopefully, I can provide some insight. When we talk about ADHD, so these are children with challenging behaviors, right? They have problems with inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. And, and something that is remarkable about ADHD is that these are not abnormal behaviors, right? We are all inattentive sometimes. In fact, there's probably a few people in this room right now that are exhibiting symptoms of inattention, right? The, they're normal, typical behaviors everybody does. We all forget things once in a while. We all have trouble persisting with tasks that are boring. We sometimes lose things, right, like a remote control or a car keys. We're all overactive sometimes. So when we're working at work and we really have to sit down and, uh, and bear down and, and do something, we might get up out of our seat and get a drink of water or go to the kitchen or do things like that, right? And we all act without thinking sometimes. We say things we wish we hadn't said or we might interrupt somebody. These are normal behaviors. What ADHD is characterized is by developmentally inappropriate levels of these behaviors. So if we're talking about a four-year-old, what's developmentally inappropriate is going to be different than if we're talking about a seven-year-old, and that's going to be different if we're talking about a 17-year-old, and that's going to be different if we're talking about a 37-year-old. So the thing that's important to think about with ADHD is that these are behavioral excesses. The inattention happens more than we would predict given the same age level. How many people in here have been in a preschool classroom? These behaviors happen all day, every day, right? It's almost constant. So if we're talking about a four-year-old and we're thinking about ADHD, this would be a child that's more inattentive and overactive and impulsive than all the other four-year-olds in the room. That's an important thing to remember with ADHD. More important than the symptoms, though, no one's ever come to me and said, I'm really concerned about my child's fidgeting, and they often don't sustain attention in tasks that require sustained mental effort, and they blurt out answers before questions have been completed. They never talk about these symptoms of ADHD. When they come in, they talk about these things. Developmentally inappropriate behaviors that are pervasive, chronic, and result in impairment in functioning. So these problems have to be to such a level that they're in excess, and they also cause you trouble. So they, they get you into trouble with your teacher, and your teacher can't do the sorts of things she typically does, or he typically does with you, because of these behaviors, are getting, these are getting in the way. Or parents are finding that they're having to do a whole lot more parenting and redirection and corrections because these behaviors are getting in the way. It causes problems, and so maybe they avoid going to family parties or to Sunday services or other things like that because the child's behavior is so disruptive. That's causing impairment in functioning, right? Uh, maybe the child has a lot of trouble in peer interactions when they're in small groups with other kids. They're always uh, sitting too close to the other kids, not um, respecting their personal space, or they're touching the other kids, or annoying them, or teasing them. 
that's going to cause them problems. Other kids aren't going to want to sit next to them and, or invite them to play in games. That's impairment in functioning. And as we talk about timeout from positive reinforcement for ADHD, it's going to be real important to always be mindful that that's what we want timeout to fix. It's not, the goal of it isn't to make a kid less fidgety or to pay attention, but it's going to be to fix problems in functioning. And, and that's uh, something I'll probably emphasize a couple times through here. And as you think about your own practice, you should really be thinking about how can I use this tool as a strategy to make this kid's life better. That's what the goal of any intervention is. We have a little cartoon here. We talked about developmental excesses. Dennis the Menace is a good example of this, right? The teacher's saying here, I shouldn't complain about Dennis. He makes all my other students seem well-behaved, right? <laughs> They're all doing these things, but he's doing them more so than everybody else. I, in my work, whenever anybody asks me what I do, I say, oh, well, I used to say, I work with children who have ADHD. And Every time, almost, somebody will say, well, isn't that just because of all these computers? Or isn't that because of bad parents? Or isn't that because, uh, you know, everybody's so busy these days? And I think it's instructive to, to think about ADHD behaviors have actually been around for a really long time. There, there's actually some interesting stories from the 1800s where if you read them, they're, they're, one's called Fidgety Philip and one's called Johnny Look in the Air. If you read them, they actually list the current DSM symptoms for ADHD as part of the story. So Fidgety Phillip's mother becomes cross at him because he spills his milk every day at dinner, and Johnny the Look in the Air is always forgetting his books and his pencil for school. And as you read along, these are all the sorts of behaviors that we currently think about as problematic for ADHD. I think the point is these are behaviors that have been around for a really long time. We call it a different thing now, right? We call it ADHD, but back in the 1800s, they probably said these are kids that are making trouble or are, are causing difficulties for other folks around them. But there's actually a collection of stories. They're all kind of interesting to read. And if you're a fan of 19th century literature, um, none of them have good endings. <laughs> this is one nice thing about our current uh, uh, century. Uh, we're a little more optimistic. ADHD is also fairly prevalent. So people often ask, you know, how often does ADHD occur? Uh, what's the likelihood I might come across a child with ADHD in a classroom I'm working in or with a family I might be working with? We did a survey where we asked teachers across the country, how many kids are, do you have in your classroom who have been identified to you as having ADHD? So that was the first question we asked. And we asked a follow-up question. We said, how many children do you think you have in your class who have ADHD? They have the characteristic behaviors of ADHD, but they haven't been identified as such yet. And what we found was, across the whole country, you can look at the numbers here, about 8 to 12% of kids across the country were thought to have the types of behaviors that are characteristic of ADHD. And so if you have about 20 to 22 kids per classroom, it's about one to two kids per class, and every classroom in America, on average, has these behavioral excesses that cause trouble in functioning. It's useful to think about that this is, a prob this is not a problem that it only occurs in clinics or in specialized hospital settings or, or every once in a while when you're working with kids. If you're working with children in large group settings, in community programs, in schools, or with parents, chances are any group or any class you work with is going to have ADHD, uh, children with ADHD-like behaviors that are going to need to be addressed. And so I think that's useful to think about, that this is a pretty prevalent problem that happens quite frequently all the time. Does that, does that sound about right for those of you that work in groups and community programs or summer programs or after-school programs? There's one or two kids per group that really take extra attention on your part. Sometimes it's more, right? So, and sometimes it's a little less. But it's usually not everybody, but there's a, a small group that really needs uh, your care. Does that sound, see some head nodding? I don't think it's a small group. I think it's a greater group. You think it might be more in, so? In my experience, yes. Okay, so in your experience, it's not necessarily one or two kids per group, but maybe more. And, and there is variability across different settings and groups, and sometimes there's different referral patterns to different programs that could be more. If it's more, you've got to do more work, right? Yes, most definitely. So I talked about impairment and functioning being uh, something to really focus on. These are some of the areas where kids with ADHD have problems. So 
We, uh, uh, Dr. Pelham and I and other colleagues developed a, a quick measure, it's a, and I think it's on the FIU website, that uh, helps you identify areas of impairment. And the typical places we think about are peer relationships. That's a place where kids with ADHD struggle. I just had, in our clinic a couple weeks ago, a mother came in, it was a mother of a third grade child, and we were talking about how things were going with the school year. And, uh, the mother was saying, well, things are going pretty well with academics. Uh, we, you know, we're doing this daily report card, and that's been helping with behavior in the classroom. But, you know, I had a realization the other day. Uh, we just came back from winter break to school, and it occurred to me that my son hasn't been invited to a birthday party yet for any of his classmates. And she said, you know, in past years, there were birthdays in September and October and November and December, and they would go to the bounce houses, right, or they'd go to Chuck E. Cheese, you know, different pizza places and things like that. And she said, I'm not sure what's happening with that, but I know that these parties are happening because my son's come home and said, oh, so-and-so had a birthday last week, but he hasn't gotten any invitations. And I'm really concerned about that because that suggests that the other kids don't want my son around them. And, and I think... It's very sad, and it's not just a peer relationships problem, right? Because eight-year-olds don't write out envelopes and put a stamp on it and walk to the mailbox and put it in. This is a problem, which is the second one up there. This ADHD causes adult relationship problems. So this is a, a, a grown-up saying we're not we're going to exclude this child, and that's something that. I take very seriously in my work that when I hear about these sorts of stories, these are the sorts of things that make me work really hard for the families I'm working with because I want that kid to eventually get invited to birthday parties and be part of the group. And if there's things that I can do as a professional to move them in that direction, that's absolutely what I want to do, especially if there's evidence behind it that says this is the best practice and I'm going to get this child on the right road faster, then that's, that's a good thing to do. Sibling relationships are often a big problem. Those, how many... Um, People in here have a sibling. You argue with siblings a lot, right? That, that's typical. In fact, I, I did, when I was in college, we did some research comparing how siblings interact with peers. And, and what we found out was that uh, you're always meaner to your siblings and you're always nicer to your peers. And that's because your peers can hit the road, right? <laughs> you're stuck with your siblings and so you can take a little, few more liberties with them. But if you have ADHD and you're doing the same sorts of things with your siblings that you might do with your peers, if you're poking them all the time or pushing their buttons or getting them to, to scream and then your parents come in and they get upset because of that, uh, you're going to have problems over time. And if the magnitude of that is very high, that can cause a lot of dysfunction in home settings. And that's often a target of intervention that parents want to address. And as we talk about time out throughout today, uh, that's all, that always comes up. As I have multiple children in the home, how am I going to use this intervention across different ages or different kinds of kids or who are diff doing different kinds of behaviors? And we'll talk about that. Uh, other areas where there may be impairment is in academic progress. Kids may feel bad about themselves if they are having failure experiences in the home or school or other places, potentially. We know that children with ADHD are often uh, quite well behaved and quite pleasant to interact with one-on-one. -on -one. Have people had that experience? If you're doing maybe some assessment or testing or talking to them or uh, working with them. But when you, we put the child in a group, they really struggle because now the adult's attention isn't 100%. It might be 10% because it's divided across 10 kids. Or if it's in a classroom, it might be 5% of the adult's attention and because it's, it's divided across 20 kids. And children with ADHD often struggle with those kinds of settings because sometimes uh, the, cue, the cues that we give off as adults are less clear to them, possibly. They may get bored easily with having to wait their turn because all the other kids are going first. And, and all of those things cause problems in groups. So the good news is, even though I've been talking about some of the bad news, these are some of the, the struggles that kids with ADHD may have, there are treatments that are best practice. They're evidence-based and they work. The first is behavior modification. Behavior modification is working with parents and teachers and clinicians and counselors and support staff and related services providers, whoever may be working with the child. Behavior modification teaches them how to set up the child's environment and situation to make them maximally successful. So it thinks real carefully about how can we set up things up front ahead of time and prevent problems from occurring. And it also teaches these folks how to deal with misbehavior when it occurs in, in a practical and useful way, as we'll talk about time out. But it also teaches them how to deal with appropriate behavior when it occurs in a practical and useful way. So 
at the same time you're kind of trying to dampen the negative behavior, you're trying to boost up the adaptive skills of the child, their competencies, and you're trying to make them more successful in the situations where they, where they may struggle. And behavior modification can occur in multiple settings. It can occur in classrooms. It can occur in parenting programs. So you teach parents the same things you might teach a teacher to do. And it also can occur in after school programs, summer treatment programs. That's a best practice setting to, do, to implement behavior modification as well. And all, all of you that raised your hands when you said, yeah, we do the summer treatment program, that, that has been found to be a best practice intervention uh, across the whole country. The other thing that works for ADHD is stimulant medication. So some of you may have come across kids that are taking methylphenidate or uh, Concerta or Dexedrine or Adderall, different stimulant preparations such as that. That is an intervention that has been shown in the short term to help kids focus more, follow rules better, and, and reduce their motor activity. You can do one more thing. You can combine behavior modification with stimulant medication, put those two things together, and that's a best practice approach as well. Beyond these three things, there's very weak to no evidence in the whole field for all the other things people do for kids with ADHD. So individual one-on-one -on -one counseling has not been found to be an effective intervention, even though many kids with ADHD get counseling. And that's because what we just talked about a moment ago, right? I said many kids with ADHD can behave really well when, when they're with you one-on-one, -on -one, right? In fact, they could tell you what they're supposed to do. So my first, when, when I did a counseling case on internship, I remember sitting down, talked with the kid for an hour. It was a very insightful young lady. She told me, uh, you know, about how she has to listen when her parents tell her to do something. And when the teacher gives her work, she should just sit down and do it. And, you know, when, other, when she has an argument with other kids, she should just talk about it with them and make sure that they compromise. And she used the word compromise. And I thought, boy, this is a very sophisticated young lady. Why is she even sitting here? And then... Uh, we were all done and I brought her back out to the waiting room with her mother and the first thing she did was rip the mom's magazine out of her hands and say, I want to go. And she ran out all the way down the hallway and down the stairs and almost into the parking lot. The mom and I had to chase after her. So the, the thing to think about is, and I think uh, Russ Barkley said this one time, and I think it's a smart way to think about uh, ADHD. It's not that children with ADHD don't know what to do. They do, right? They've been told more than any other kid in their whole neighborhood what to do, right? They, they know what to do. It's that children with ADHD don't do what they know. So when you put them in a situation where they really have to perform those behaviors, they got to listen to their parents, they got to do their work, they got to get along with the other kids, for some reason or another, they have a hard time performing the behaviors that they need to do in those situations. And so that's why outside interventions, like behavior modification, can be helpful because the parents and teachers and clinical staff and counselors and all the other folks are helping accommodate that child to make them more successful in those settings. You guys with me so far? This is just a slide that shows pretty uh, briefly. There's some, sometimes people say, well, behavior modification doesn't work or uh, I'm not sure if it's really an effective treatment uh, for kids with ADHD. In fact, the evidence is a resoundingly clear behavior modification approaches are effective for kids with ADHD. It's a best practice. So if you look at lots and lots of studies, there's probably more than a hundred different studies of kids with ADHD represented on here starting in the 1960s all the way up until today. The effect of behavior modification in all kinds of designs and all kinds of studies from all kinds of kids from all different parts of the country and in fact the world shows if you apply behavior modification approaches consistently, you get good outcomes. The kids do better. Their parents rate them as better behaved. Their teachers rate them as better behaved. Observers that look at them who don't really know what the kid is uh, in the intervention for the treatment, they're blind to the, all the reasons behind why they're coming in to observe. They even say the kid is better over time. All of the evidence suggests that these are good interventions and they're things everybody should be doing with kids with ADHD uh, because it's your best bet that you're going to make a big difference. Okay, so that's just a quick overview of ADHD. I presume most people in here are generally familiar, so I'm not going to belabor the point. I'm going to try to transition now into talking about timeout and talk about timeout globally. I'm going to talk about timeout, uh, parts of timeout, and then I'm going to talk about how we might use a timeout program for kids with ADHD, okay? I should say, first of all, timeout's been around for a long time, right? It wasn't hard to find a couple of old-fashioned pictures. Uh, 
the, you can think about the old-fashioned dunce cap, right? A child in the schoolhouse would be sent to the corner. <laughs> Luckily, we don't have these in our towns anymore, but they would time out adults, right, for bad things, and you get put in the stocks. I uh, worked really hard. Actually, the longest part of putting together this whole talk was trying to figure out who invented timeout. And it was, uh, so I did what most people did, right? I went to Google and I typed in who invented timeout. And of course, I got referred number one to Wikipedia. And, and what I did, this is something I learned in graduate school. I didn't just look at Wikipedia and say, okay, this is who invented timeout. We actually looked at all the references that they cited on Wikipedia. If I knew how to change it, I probably would try to. None of the references they cited for the invention of timeout actually went back to a publication or a book that said anything about who invented timeout. The best we could do was that we found this uh, University of Hawaii website, and this was, uh, I think you pronounce it stats, I think. Uh, this is what he had written there um, back in the 60s, and I'll just give you a moment to read it over, but this sounds pretty much like a current timeout procedure, right? Pretty straightforward, right? My daughter was misbehaving. I put her in her crib. She had to stay there until she started behaving. Then I took her out. And uh, if we go to a restaurant and my daughter misbehaves, I take her out of the restaurant until she starts to behave. Then I bring her back in. That's a, a pretty straightforward description of a timeout program. I asked my children, I said, I'm giving this talk on timeout, so could you please uh, draw a picture of me giving you a timeout? <laughs> and so, this is my son, Tom. This is his picture. This is my daughter, Julia. He's eight. She's five. And you can, I'm an applied behavior analyst, so I don't really put much stock in projective tests or, you know, draw a figure, those sorts of things. But I think you can learn a few things from this picture right away. One is I'm an impeccable dresser. I mean, look at the, these nice outfits. I have to add a comb into my routine, clearly. I have very spiky hair. And when I'm upset, I flap my arms like a bird, right? But, the thing that I thought was useful about this is my son's little uh, addition here. You're, you're mad when you give time out, right? And uh, my daughter, Julia, she's very sweet. She actually drew me with a smile. And my son said, no, he doesn't look like that. And he made it into a yell. <laughs> so time, the thing to think about is we give time outs at times which are hard for us as adults, right? We're, we're not, this is not where we're handing out candy or complimenting or giving gold stars. These are high pressure, high emotion times. And that's a useful thing to think about as we talk about all these strategies as we go on through. Uh, we know that uh, timeout was further developed and further refined by Connie Hamm. And what she did is she had a two-stage approach to parent training. She said, you know, the first thing we got to do is we got to work on the relationship between the parent and the child. And so we're going to spend a lot of time boosting that up and refining that relationship. Then, once we got a good relationship, we're going to teach parents how to put demands on kids in a way that's going to get results. And if the kids don't give the results that we're expecting, we're going to figure out how to have prudent consequences that will encourage positive results in the future. And what she did is save time out till the end. She taught all the positive attending strategies and um, relationship building strategies first, and time out was one of the last things that the kids learned. Around the same time, uh, Gerald Patterson was working with children who had conduct problems or disruptive behaviors or uh, really uh, difficult to manage behaviors. And here's what he was writing about, that you remove the child from the situation where he receives many reinforcers, and he's placed in a situation where he receives few, if any, reinforcers. So that's time out from positive reinforcement, right? <coughs> Take them out, and then you put them back in when they're ready. At the same time, Rex Forehand was doing a lot of work on timeout as an intervention. These are very interesting studies to read. Uh, he was in Georgia, and he was putting advertisements in newspapers saying, are you a parent of a three or four or five-year-old, a mother? And if you are, please come into our laboratory. And they would have them come in, and they would have a one-way mirror so they could look through and watch the mother interact with the child. Sometimes they give them instructions with a bug in the ear about what to do. And they would have the moms do all kinds of different things, and they would study what the things were that were successful with getting children to pick up their toys, 
and what things didn't work to pick up your toys. And over lots and lots of studies, they figured out, well, we got a pretty good program here. You give a good instruction, you follow it up, you give a timeout if they don't listen, you praise them if they do listen, and if they get a timeout, then you give them the first instruction all over again, and you repeat that until you get those toys picked up. And they developed all kinds of manuals. A lot of the studies that we're going to talk about that refer to parts of timeout uh, are done by he and his students, and, and, they're, and they're really nice studies to read. So that's kind of the history of timeout, how it was developed. I'm curious in here, how many people have assigned a timeout? Is it ever it, 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 given a timeout to your child or given a timeout to a child you're working with? Is it everybody? Yeah. It's a very commonly applied behavior management principle, right? People are very familiar with it. If you ask parents at their well child visit, so they go to the doctor for their annual checkup, about half of them say they've used timeout in the past month, and about half of them have removed privileges, which you can also think about as timeout from positive reinforcement, right? If you ask pediatricians, if a parent comes in for their well child visit and they complain about their child being aggressive or doing some fighting or, or not minding, what do you think the most common recommendation is from a pediatrician? It's timeout, right? We also know if you're a parent of a child with ADHD, studies show that you're most likely to, you're more likely than parents of uh, comparison kids who didn't have ADHD to use timeout. So it's, a, it's even more common amongst a population of parents who have a child with ADHD. And that's not surprising, right? Because these are kids that are doing more behaviors that get them into trouble. And we, we know that they're not only using it more often, the number of timeouts they have to assign over a given period of time is much greater. So they're not only more familiar with it, they're using it more, and, they're using, and, and by more, they're using it more frequently. Timeouts also widely disseminated. So I don't know, I can remember when timeout was disseminated into my home. I was in kindergarten, and my mother said, from now on, if you don't listen to me, you're going to go sit in this chair. And all of a sudden, that chair became just not just a piece of furniture. It became something we all avoided actively in our home. And it was in uh, the living room where it was really boring, and, and none of us liked it. Around the 80s or when all these studies of parent training started to come out and say this is something with merit, how many people have seen Super Nanny or Nanny 911 or something like that? I always find it very interesting. In fact, we wrote a little letter to the editor for, of a behavioral psychologist newsletter about this. I think about all the parents I've trained in parent training, maybe it's 400 or 500. That, that may be a good number. Probably many of you, it's about the same. The Nielsen ratings for the Super Nanny Show suggest it goes out to over two or three million people, sometimes even more than that, every showing. And one of her uh, interventions is, she calls it the naughty stuff, but essentially that's timeout, right? So when you think about that, anybody that watched the show has learned about how to do a timeout, and they've actually seen examples of parents giving timeout. They've seen bad examples of parents giving timeout, right? Then, then what does she do? She comes in with her little laptop and she says, see, here's where all the places where you messed up, do it this way. And so then they see good examples of doing timeout. So we should expect that all the parents we work with in fact, probably many of the teachers and probably uh, many of the clinicians like you who are on the front line have seen lots and lots and lots of examples of people giving timeouts. It's, it is widely disseminated. But there's some problems with dissemination that always happen. So I always think it's instructive to go back to the people that developed these things. And if you read what uh, Forehand and Long said, uh, they even used an exclamation part exclamation mark. It might be the only one in their whole book. They said it's important to follow the procedures exactly as we present them. Minor changes can decrease the effectiveness of timeout significantly. Right? With emphasis. When we disseminate things, we know that people drift. So how many people in here have ever been a supervisor of somebody? I'm always amazed that I'll, we'll say something, we'll come to an agreement, this is how we're going to handle this classroom or these kids, and I'll go back the next day, and they're doing something completely different. <laughs> what happened here? Well, life got in the way, right? Something happened, probably made, jarred them off course, they end up in a different place. People drift all the, even within a day. Now imagine if you just talked about timeout with a parent or a teacher once, and you come back in three months, what are the chances they're doing exactly what you talked about, right? It's probably zero. The other thing that happens with dissemination is people do something that's called reinvention. So 
we have a really good product, right? Time out from positive reinforcement. We're gonna roll it out. And then somebody in a school district says, you know what, I don't like this part about uh, time out where the kid's sitting off to the back of the room. That doesn't seem right. Let's move them up to the front of the room. And it seems like a good idea, right? But now by being in the front of the room, that child can make faces at everybody and get all kinds of attention, right? The, the program doesn't work anymore. It's a completely different program than the one that was originally developed. So that's probably one reason why about a third of parents, if you ask them, say timeout doesn't work. It's not an effective intervention. It's not something I want to keep trying. One argument I'm going to make throughout this talk today is that timeout doesn't necessarily not work. The way it's being done at present is not working. But there may be other alternatives or options that might be considered by that parent or teacher or clinician that could work. And that's something, that's the one thing I hope folks take out of here today is that just because somebody says what they're doing right now it doesn't work, I'm going to give you lots of ideas of places where you can make changes or tweaks or refine a system to maybe make it more effective for the person you're working with or for yourself. And I think the example of reinvention, I can't, I can't remember if this was my idea or if I heard this idea somewhere else, but has anyone ever been to New York City? If you want to go to famous Ray's Pizza, that's the famous pizza place. Well, every corner in New York City, there's a famous Ray's, and then they're all the original, right? The original famous Ray's, and they're all over the place. Well, in fact, these are all independently owned shops that are all called Ray's. Uh, there's a kind of interesting, there's even a not famous Ray's. So, uh, and if you look at their menus, well, look at the outside of all the stores. They all look different, right? If you look at their menus, they all serve pizza, but some of them have garlic knots, some of them don't, some of them have jerk chicken, some of them don't. They're all, they're all completely different. And the same thing has happened in our field when we think about timeout. When somebody comes in and says, I'm using timeout, it's just like Famous Ray's. You don't know if this is the one that has the good pizza or the bad pizza. You don't know if it's the one that serves chicken wings or not. You, you don't know any of that stuff. And so as good clinicians, our job is to figure out what does somebody mean when they, when they talk about timeout. That's something we'll talk about at the end of today. But it's an important thing to think about that timeout is now a catch-all for all kinds of things parents do. Some of them are related to timeout from positive reinforcement. And some of the things they're doing, it could be something completely different, uh, but they're just using that label. I also want to make sure to acknowledge timeout can be controversial. Has anybody in here ever thought that timeout can be a controversial intervention? Some, something I'm concerned about often when I'm working with children, I don't want a child to feel isolated or ostracized or, or left out or that sort of thing. Uh, that's something we should be mindful all throughout this talk is how to do this intervention in a, in a sensitive way that is going to help the child rather than, than hurt the child. Uh, there's uh, some thought, some folks in the field may think that timeout isn't effective because it just puts the child away for a little while. It doesn't teach them any particular skill. And uh, doesn't teach them moral reasoning or any of those things. And um, this particular gentleman was complaining about the naughty corner. I probably wouldn't call anything the naughty corner. <laughs> Timeout's probably a little bit nicer or cool down corner or something like that. Um, but that's something that sometimes comes up with parents or teachers or other folks that they uh, don't want to use timeout because they're not sure if it's an effective approach. And uh, it probably is worthwhile to acknowledge that many roads can lead to Rome. So timeout is not the only intervention in, in our whole toolbox of things we can do with kids with ADHD. You might have some kids where timeout isn't what really needs to happen. They might have a skill deficit. So they might not be able to do the thing that you're asking them to do, like pick up all these toys. Maybe their attention is so low that they couldn't pick up a whole room of toys, and the right intervention would not be timing them out and then trying to get them to do the thing they can't do all over again. It might be breaking it down into small steps and doing one small thing at a time. Put all the green crayons away in the box and then put all the markers in the box. Or it could be overcorrection. That's a, a thing, too. You might say, okay, well, you weren't listening, so we're going to practice this. I want you to put these, put these green crayons away. Okay, now dump them out. We're going to try it again. Make sure you know how to do it. Put these crayons away. And you might do it over and over and over again to make sure the child actually knows the skill. But once you know, once you're confident they know what they're doing, I, I would argue that timeout could be a, uh, a viable intervention, which I'll, I'll talk about today. Uh, the other thing that often comes up when I'm working with parents, and especially in groups of parents, somebody say, "All that kid needs is a good spanking." Right? I heard that more times than I can count. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I do not want to get into a discussion about corporal punishment. I, I don't have an interest in that. The, uh, 
Point being, if we're talking about ADHD, I think if spanking worked, we wouldn't be sitting in front of those parents, right? It's likely something that they tried at some point along the line. And uh, timeout is a way to deal with high rate negative behaviors like we can expect with ADHD in a, in a humane and a proactive way and in a way that may reduce negative behaviors over time. Because I've never met a parent yet who held that infant in their arms and they said, I can't wait to yell at you and scream at you and be so frustrated with you, I wanted to go into another room and then put you in your room for the whole night, right? Nobody says that. People say, I can't wait to spend time with you. I want to enjoy your childhood. I want to grow, I want to watch you grow up and be proud of you. And so the parents aren't interested in putting their kids in timeout for long periods of time. Uh, parents are interested in having their kids behave and follow ru the rules of their home and the expectations of the home so they can enjoy all the naturally good things that happen in families. And, and maybe there's a, a reasonable segue into this. I'm going to tell you two stories, okay? I'm going to tell you a story about uh, my son, Tom. He was, he was born in, well, I probably shouldn't even try to guess this year because I always forget. Uh, his mom's much better at this than I am. I think he was born in 2003. He went to daycare. He was in daycare all the way through. We moved to Mississippi for a year. He went to daycare uh, sometime there. We moved to Buffalo. He went to preschool. All these times, all the teachers were telling us what a wonderful child he was. And I said, well, of course, yes, that's my son, right? And, you know, he was taking his naps in daycare. And, you know, when he did finger paint, he did a good job with his finger paint in preschool, all these sorts of things, right? And he went to kindergarten, and he was starting to learn his letters, and we're real proud of him about that. And he went to first grade, and the first week of first grade, I got a frantic call from my wife, and she said, Thomas got a bad note home. I said, what are you talking about he got a bad note home? He says, he wasn't quiet during rest time. I said, what do you mean he wasn't quiet during rest time? You should be quiet during rest time. And so I went through the rest of work, and then I went home, and I said to my wife, uh, this is a big problem. And she said, well, what should we do about this? And I said, I have no idea. And she said, you're a child psychologist. What do you mean you have no idea? I said, well, you're his mother. You're supposed to answer these questions. And so what we decided to do, he didn't like writing very much, so he said, you know what, Tom, you, this is unacceptable. You need to write a note that says you're very sorry for being loud during rest time, and you'll never do it again, and you have to say sincerely, Thomas J. Fabiano. Now, this took an hour, and there's tears, and you know, we're standing there like wondering, do we do the right thing? And we're, okay. Finish the note, and then he went, no dessert tonight, you're going to bed, okay? And uh, we're very upset about this. And so next day he goes into school, and, and we're both, I'm waiting at my phone at 2.10 for when he gets off the bus because I want to know what happened with this teacher. And my wife calls and says, you know, it's very strange. He came off the bus and uh, said, the teacher doesn't even know why we made him write that note. It wasn't that big of a deal. <laughs> I think, oh, great. <laughs> great. And then he's gone to second grade, now he's in third grade. I know my son's gotten into trouble at school. He's gotten into plenty of trouble at home, right? He's, he's had, like all kids, get in trouble. And, you know, he's probably had disagreements with kids on the bus. And, but those things have gotten resolved and they've worked out. And as I look back, we've had one time of really having to go to bat about behavior with our kid with respect to what we saw was a serious negative behavior. Now think about a child with ADHD, right? Think about a kid that you may have worked with in the past. And let's not think about them from birth until third grade. Let's think about one morning and one day of their life, OK? First thing is that they don't get out of bed on time, right? And you have a parent rushing to get out the door. And, and they know that this is a child that dawdles sometimes. So they're really trying to be proactive. And they get up early. And they say, get out of bed. And the kid's hiding under the covers. And then they finally have to almost pull them out of bed and say, get dressed. And then they go and start getting ready for their day. And uh, they come back in. And the child's wearing one sock and their underwear. And they're not dressed at all. And the parent says, what's, what's going on? We do this every morning. You, your clothes are laid out for you. Put on your underwear. Put on your socks. Put on your pants. Put on your shirt and come down for breakfast. 
and they go down to make breakfast and they come and the kids has their shirt on backwards and they're walking around playing with their toys or something like that. And th now they have to yell, at, I told you to get ready, get down here for breakfast. And so they get down to breakfast and the kid is goofing around and kicking his sister underneath the table so much so that she gets upset and spills her milk and it's all over the table. Now this is a big, and it went all over the bills the parent put together the night before, right? That they stayed up late to do and so now they got to clean this up and so they're very frustrated at this point and they, now they're going down to the bus stop and, but where's your backpack? How did you lose your backpack? You come in the door, you put it down and you go on with your day. Where is your bag? Why is it in the back room? There's no reason for it to be there. Get it. And the kid gets their backpack and now they're uh, coming to the bus stop and instead of just standing there waiting for the bus like everybody else, they start kicking the gravel on the street towards the other kid and it's hitting the shins and the mother standing next to them and that mother is glaring at the, uh, the mother and they're trying to stop them from doing that. And, and then they finally get on the bus and the parent says, but it's not, but it's not over for this child, right? Because they get on the bus and the bus driver says, you sit right behind me. We're not doing that hopping around from seat to seat to seat that you've been doing every day so far this week. You go right behind me. And so the kid sits there, but this is an eight-year-old. Kindergarteners sit behind the bus driver. Why is an eight-year-old sitting there? So you have all the other kids throwing little spitballs at the kid, teasing him because he's there, and he's getting agitated and trying to reach around, and hit, right? And the bus driver's got to pull over, and he, then she, he doesn't yell at the whole bus. She yells at that kid she saw reaching around, right? And then you get off the bus, and the bus driver says, Phew. but now the bus aide says, hey, you can't be over there. Get in line with everybody else. Stop right. right. Okay, you get the point, right? It's not even 8 o'clock in the morning, and this child has had more negative interactions with adults and peers in an hour than most kids have in their whole school career. <laughs> Literally, right? Think, wrap your head around that and think about that. Is it any wonder that when we try a behavioral intervention, it doesn't work the first day we try it out or the first hour we try it out? Yet our expectation is that we're going to do something just a little bit different and we're going to undo all this damage that's happened for five or six or ten years. I don't blame the kids for getting frustrated and shutting down and giving up on us as adults if those are our expectations, if we refuse to acknowledge those things. So when we talk about time out from positive reinforcement or really any behavioral intervention, as adults, we have to remember that it may take just as long as it took to develop all those bad habits to develop those good habits. And so what we need to do as professionals is be patient, take careful notes, and, and collect data on how well things are working, not just base things on our uh, per perception. And we need to stick with stuff. We need to keep doing that for long periods of time if we really expect a big payoff in our professional practice. I think that's an important thing for all of us to think about as we go forward today because those are the sorts of things that uh, sometimes get ignored or when you're caught up in the moment of working with a kid that maybe we don't acknowledge is, is being really important. I think that's the most important thing that we really want the, to, we want to be the people in this kid's life that aren't doing all those negative things, right? We want to be the shining stars that they think about as a mentor or a supporter or somebody that's, uh, that really helped them get through uh, some tough times. And now I talked about what it was like for the kid, right? Think about what it's like for that parent. Or think about what it's like for that teacher. Or you can give yourself a little pat on the back for that professional who's working with the child, right? You're doing much more intervention, redirections, distractions, reprimands, uh, acknowledgments. You're doing much more of that overall with a child with ADHD than you're doing it for maybe all the other kids combined. In fact, you probably notice this. I often uh, go into schools and do consultations and things like that. It is a bad sign if I know a kid's name on the first day because the way I know a kid's name is uh, Roger, sit down. Roger, why are you in the back? Roger, where's your pencil? Roger, where's your eraser? Roger, where's your assignment? Right? Roger, 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 Roger. That's a, that's a bad sign if I know that kid's name because that meant the other 19 kids were just doing these things as part of their routine. And so we as adults, because we're doing so much more intervention, means we can't make the mistakes we can make if we're just doing it every once in a while. If we're making the same mistake uh, 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 times a day in the way we're dealing with a child's misbehavior or, or the way we're dealing with their appropriate behavior, that compounds to large amounts of mistakes over time and it becomes harder to undo. So I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about the parts of timeout today. The reason for that is that these are all places where we sometimes make mistakes with kids with ADHD. We do things that aren't appropriate for them or don't work for them. And we want to make sure that uh, if we're doing an intervention, we think carefully about every single little part of the engine that's driving that intervention.